Do you want to own your own business? Have ideas for making things better in the company where you work? You have the entrepreneurial spirit. On this show, we answer dozens of questions and we've got more than a dozen people to answer them. We've asked people who do comedy for a living and a woman who makes fancy dog dishes. We've got stories about success and failure, victory and defeat. So enjoy the show. Maybe you'll find the inspiration you need to make a move, put forward an idea, change a social injustice, and maybe make the world a better place. I'm Pat Job. Thank you for making the connection. We're here at Theater 99 with the Have Nots. They're an improvisational theater company. Well, they're the mama and daddy rabbits of an improvisational theater company. They work with a bunch of actors and actresses here in this downtown Charleston theater. And what we're talking about today is not only how do you innovate to the level that you own your own theater company and you, own, and you work out of a theater uh, that is basically your business, but how do you make stuff up all the time? I mean, you guys are sort of the cutting edge of creativity around that kind of stuff. Can you give us some idea of how that works? <laughs> That's a great question, actually, <laughs> Pat, because, I mean, yeah, I mean, you hit the, the nail on the head there is that, I mean, I think with years of experience, we've been together for almost 12 years now, the years of experience, some things become easier in terms of not having to invent the wheel every single time, but then there's a given Tuesday when you have no clue how you've gotten to some situation as an entrepreneur or as a creative artist or as a producer of some event and then you gotta you gotta invent the wheel again to solve that problem so yeah it is hard to um, to meet each specific challenge but with years uh, and going and uh, learn doing things over and over again we kinda learn skills like anybody does in any kind of specialized industry that to solve problems maybe a little quicker than before I think we do it mostly through talking to each other and getting each other's good ideas with good ideas, you're also gonna come up with big hurdles and not letting those, like I think we do a good job of when there's a challenge, we work better than ever when we have a challenge. Like opening this theater, for instance, was a big challenge. The opening this theater pushes to the very edge of our ability as both human beings and uh, business people and friends. I mean, it pushes to the very edge of that breaking point and it was only the fact that, that um, I believe, and we probably all would weigh in on this, that, that our model was strong and our, our goal was the right goal and we had years of experience to support a situation where everything seemed like this place wouldn't open. And then in the end, it finally did. This venture, the new theater, is it's bigger in size, a lot more seats, about 50% more uh, seats than the last theater. And so that it has all those challenges. And the first, it was, it was kind of nice, um, I guess even in an entrepreneurial way. You st we started small. We have a very small, very manageable, like right. every, everything about it was manageable. Easy, <laughs> easy to keep clean, easy to, all the things you don't think about. We're like, oh, open a theater, we'll do shows. Well, you gotta clean it, you gotta paint it, you gotta pay the power bills, you gotta fix stuff that breaks, you gotta keep vermin out. And keep people coming. Um, yeah, and keep people coming, you know? <laughs> We were all kind of, you know, learned through the school of hard knocks in terms of business savvy. We had a lot of great support from mm -hmm. from our audience, who are, you know, there are some lawyers, some architects, and those kind of advocates who who helped us get through it. And, this is a really, it's a weird business to be in, the theater, the entertainment business, because what you do is part owned by you, but also part kind of owned by the public. You know, like. And also, it's an industry that usually is, has a great deal of change. Just look at the movie theaters. Every week, the movies change. We don't have that luxury. We are a big part of the product. Give me back my wheelchair! <laughs> Come 8 o'clock, nobody cares. Nobody in the audience cares what you were just doing. You know, they pay, they want to see the show. It's showtime, baby. Um, the show must go on, however you want to say it, but you know, in my mind, you know, come eight o'clock, nobody cares. No one cares if we haven't been talking for two days. No one cares if, you know, if somebody's sick. They don't care. They pay for. They want to see the show. That's it. And so your your time gets managed around making a perfect show. <laughs> it didn't start as a business, it started as a love affair and then grew into a business, a pretty poor one for a real long time and then eventually one that could become an income for us. So it was a, the love affair started from day one for yeah. me. 
Your ideas can be great, but you can't do them alone. You, we couldn't build this theater alone. You couldn't build the, the community of improvisers alone. You can't, none of and it. And you gotta it's, have the emotional support too, to do this. You know, an outside thing, outside of this, you know, whether it's family, friends, whatever. And we were very fortunate. Like when we started out, we had a lot of our friends and family were behind us and, you know, excited to see where this was gonna go. And I think that played <laughs> into it a lot. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah. especially when people don't need us, they have to want us. That, that boils down to support right there. Every time someone's here, every, every ticket they buy is a show of support to this. So, I mean, we are, our theater exists as an expression of people's support because, I mean, we don't, we're not a necessity. We're, uh, we're a desire. Okay, Chris Fisher, this is, this is the back lot of uh, Fisher Recycling. Tell us about this, what we're looking at. Tell us about what, the, especially about these pieces of concrete. Start off telling us about those. The concrete came from the old Cooper River Bridge. When they okay. disassembled the bridge, we got large sections. This is what we used to drive on. Really? And, uh, we bought the sections for twelve fifty each, and then instead of disposing them or grinding them up, we reused them. Yeah, and what are you reusing them for? What, it, what uh, is the function of this stuff? Clear glass, brown glass, and our mixed glass from the restaurants. We do a six day a week cur cur curbside pickup for downtown restaurants. And then what happens to this glass? Um, it goes into our processing, where the glass, whole bottles of glass are put in to the machine, and then they're pulverized into seven different glass products, from a three quarter inch marble size to the finest sand glass sand. Wow. And then that glass is used how? Sand trap sand, roads, pathways, countertops, floors, you name it. We can, we're trying to create new markets that have never been there for glass. So what, what is Fisher Recycling? It started off as a commercial collection service for restaurants only. I was collecting bottles from T-Bones only. And then I went door to door from there and we started into the paper processing, the shredding, and now we're in the glass manufacturing. So how many pies do you have your fingers in? Mm, several. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, when we were outside earlier, we were talking about you're having fingers in lots of pies. This, this particular pie right here, I know will be of interest to our viewers. Tell us, tell us what this pie is right here. It's 100% recycled countertop. We've taken all the bottles that you saw outside, pulverized them, and then put them into a resin where they're created into forms for customized countertops. So, so the texture that we're looking at in this countertop is actually pieces of glass. 100% recycled glass from yeah. Charleston County. And, and these bins contain the different consistencies of, of glass that you grind up. Um, talk to us about that. The, the smaller, the finer stuff is almost like a baby powder. It's the finest sandblast sand, then the grades go all the way up as and something you can put your hands on and it's all marbleized glass. There are no sharp edges. So you can walk on it. It can be mixed in anything. Good for pathways, walkways, bikeways, roadways. Now, if that were used in a pathway, would it just be poured directly into a, uh, a form that creates a pathway? Exactly. People and walk on that. And... The good thing about the glass, it's already been heated and there are more sides than gravel. So the water flows clearer and easier off the glass and it will gravel. Well, talk to us about the excitement of developing these products, marketing these products, and you're even interested in some changes in legislation, I understand. Yeah, we're going to try in the second quarter, second quarter of legislation, to introduce that all new roads with the Department of Transportation have a certain percentage of recycled glass, and all new pathways for bicycles in the state use recycled glass. And what's the advantage of that? You would create an industry that has never been there in South Carolina. Instead of throwing thousands, millions of pounds of glass away a day, you would create an industry and reuse a product that's already in the state and create jobs that have never been there in the state. What would it substitute for? Gravel, all the gravel okay. and sand. So instead of having to dig gravel out of the ground and the sand pits that are drying up in the state, you would use a product that's being thrown away right now. And where does that product go when it's thrown away? Right to the landfill. And it, a bottle will never break down in the landfill. And it's our only product we have that's 100% recyclable. Carol Rawl is Harry Barker. I mean, she owns Harry Barker. She dreamed up Harry Barker. Carol, tell us, uh, give us a little thumbnail of how you got to be uh, Harry Barker's mama. Uh, well, let's see. Well, I started the company on my kitchen table in Manhattan. I 
was homebound with a life-threatening illness. I had Cushing's disease, I had a brain tumor, and had been misdiagnosed. And I started sewing, I started pet sitting. I was unemployed, living in Manhattan, so I was either picking up someone's dry cleaning or dog sitting. So I became my loft building resident dog sitter. And I was happy to have the company. And I had my dogs had chihuahuas, I had Jack Russells, pugs, mutts, you name it. And I had a full house of dogs running around. And um, since I was homebound, I started making dog beds and dog robes and dog treats and dog sweaters. And I had a little design studio in my loft and started making products for friends, just as gifts to give away. And a few editors saw some of my products that I'd given to some friends and photographed it and ended up in some national magazines like In Style and ended up on the Today Show. and. Suddenly I had a business without even trying and um, sold my loft, moved to Georgia, wrote a business plan and opened Harry Barker in Savannah in 2000. We are about 90% wholesale, 10% retail. I started out as a retailer and now I'm a humble wholesaler and we ship all over the world. We have about 3,000 wholesale clients and about 10,000 retail clients and products go out of here all day long. And you've got some of your stuff behind you. You want to yeah. you want to tell us? Uh, I'm afraid to look back. There. Yeah, <laughs> tell us a little oh bit about your stuff. Oh my God! We'll, we'll, let's see what do we have. We've got these are my personal favorites. I work as you can see. Like we work a lot with um, organic, natural fibers, and this is industrial hemp, grown without pesticides, and it's mildew resistant and antifungal. And the good news is that it does not require fertilizers to grow it, so it's a sustainable. Plant. So this is our commitment. These are our eco-friendly products. Now, why is that important to you? I want to tread lightly on this planet, and I don't. I don't want to leave heavy footprints. You know, there's a lot of pleasure. It's all about giving pleasure and making tails wag and cats purr and people smile. And you know, we're selling cheerful, happy, fun, cool things, and people get off on it. You know, for ten bucks, you can have a great time with your cat or your dog. I mean, we're just we're selling little pleasures in little boxes and it's just great. Feeds you know? your soul. It does. It's so much fun. It's fun to see it all come to life. Okay, so let's talk about owning your own business, being an entrepreneur, hiring people, dealing with money. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> I hate it. Do you? I, you know, I have a great team. I'm really lucky. I have people that are patient and understanding. Everybody pulls their own weight here, so I don't babysit, which is nice. I do a few things well, and that's what I'm good at, and I'm smart enough to know that that's what I do well, and I don't do other people's business. And I'm, Luckily, I, I, I've made very good hiring decisions, and I lucked out. Paolo Dalla Zorza is the owner of Paolo's Gelato in um, downtown Charleston. You also do magic tricks. And I know, I know that part of the magic of your life is your sense of adventure, but I'm wondering if you would just start us off with a magic trick. Are you ready to just want a magic trick? A magic trick, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't make me disappear. No, no, no. Is there no, a chance no. that you would no, make me disappear? No, no, no. no. Okay. I'll just make a little... You see there is two... Can I have your hands, please? Yes. You have yes. two little rabbits. So you keep one rabbit. I'll keep one rabbit. Keep like that, so keep not like everybody that. can yes. see. And I'll yes. make any magic tricks. It's just one rabbit here and one rabbit here. Okay. Right. I forgot. And open. Okay. Hey, you have two rabbits. The clonation of rabbits. You see, we talk about the clonation of rabbits. Talk, talk about the fun that you have in, in, doing, in doing your shop and doing your plan. I always play with my customer. I always I like playing with my customer. Like I said, yeah. when people ask me, what is this? I say, rat poison. Right. You know, we don't do vanilla in my gelato. No we vanilla? Do, no vanilla. No Absolutely. Vanilla. I don't do vanilla. If you can both Ben & Jerry, Cold Stone, they open Cold Stone, they can do vanilla. I don't do vanilla. Yeah. And just this is because uh, I don't think it's Italian flavor and not necessary. You know, I don't want. I want to do as much as I can authentic, mm -hmm. and that's what I what I'm doing is uh, just authentic, and that's what I am. I'm not selling Coke. I don't mm -hmm. sell a Diet Coke. I have only Italian uh, drinks, mm -hmm. and I try to keep like that because you can go anywhere you want. You know, my idea when people come here is for five minutes they in Italy. Regarding to be immigrant um, in this country, you know, it's not very easy. We want to come here. I like America because there is plenty of opportunity. It's a land opportunity. I think in, uh, if you believe in what you want, your American dream becomes true. And when you do, you have on your own job, on your self-employed, you work 17 hours a day. There's mm -hmm. no doubt. I think I'm always on call, like a doctor. 
Matt Bauer is president of Better World Telecom. He lives in Charleston now. He and uh, his partner started this company. Matt, tell us about your company. All right, Pat. Well, we, uh, we started about five years ago, and we are a provider of voice and data services across the country, like in AT&T or Verizon or whatever they're called now as they're all merging together. And so we provide these services to organizations that have a social or a green mission, for-profits, non-profits, and uh, we save them about 28% off of their monthly bills. We donate 3% of our revenues back to uh, causes that support social justice and sustainability. It, it's been shown over and over again, there are statistics out there everywhere that you, you uh, by building a sustainable local business and getting people to participate in that business, that more dollars stay in the community. Giving back is not a choice, it's a duty. Mm -hmm. If you've been given opportunities, then to not give back to the community in the same way is you're, you're cheating yourself and you're cheating, cheating the universe. I mean, it's just all about an energy that you're transferring back out. So. Tell me a story when you were really challenged and you were really pushed and you said, oh my God. I think the employees have been really the biggest challenge. Becoming the human resource department, the payroll department, and taking care of their every need. It's the hardest, absolutely the hardest part of the business. And you can't survive without them, so it's a catch-22. I wish I can have more cash flow, that some bank borrow me some money to make my gelato supply bigger. That's, this is not possible with my investor visa, I'm not allowed to. But it's all critical and it's all urgent and it's all now or yesterday and, you know, being understaffed and undercapitalized, it's, you know, you end up doing, you, I wear many hats. Sometimes the Steelers lose even though they try to win, you know what I mean? Like you try to play the game and come out a victor, but sometimes you lose the game and hopefully they love you anyway, you know? <laughs> Hopefully, Steelers. Yeah, whatever team. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say the Gamecocks, but then I would alienate half the people out there. Right. You know I mean? It's great. It's horrible. I love it. I hate it. It's, it's, it's all those, you know, life's not one note. And having a business is a, it's a living, breathing entity. It's, it has rhythms and flows and tides and, and you, you have employees and they're, I mean, it's all, it's all alive. You know, it's all every, every day. It's, the highs and the lows are all there, and I guess, and I can't wait to get up in the morning and do it all over again. It's how you wake up every day, and and you only live once. It's not a test drive. What gets you out of bed in the morning? Why why take all these risks? Why invest all this money? What's the what's the appeal for you? Mm, working for yourself and working hard, I think, is the answer, and create new things that have never been there. So they're really a, the exciting part. So it's a creative process. Yeah. Yeah. And the reward is making it happen. And so when, you lo when you're loving what you're doing, are you making the world a better place? Yes, that's what I'm thinking. Because I like what I'm doing. Sometimes it's tired, like in your job, you yeah. know, interview people, you know, right. <laughs> you can get tired. But you know, the passion is the most important thing in anything you do. Is it going to be hard for anybody to start a new business? Yeah, oh, extremely. Especially in today's market and the way things are going. We really have to find a niche and fill it. And, uh, you have to be very determ determined very focused in what you want to do and be positive, positive minded because if you're positive everything's come to you because if you're thinking oh I cannot make it of course you cannot make it, you mm -hmm. have to make it execute a very good business plan and go to SCORE and ask for help and ask a lot of people a lot of good questions before you start and have some money back in you, it helps SCORE is the Service Corps of Retired Executives exactly, the I, chamber. exactly. Yeah. they are a wealth of information and those guys have been successful and they know how to make things work. The first thing you've got to do is really put together a business plan. Business plan has two purposes. One is it is your marketing tool to go to a bank or to a lending institution and get the money to back you. I mean, you've got to have that. And, and so it really becomes your, your sales tool because it really lays out the roadmap. It tries to take all of the, the, the questionable thing, oh, I forgot about that, you know, or I didn't, I didn't look at that location strong enough, it's too big, or the rent is uh, more than I can afford, uh, and looking at my budget, you know, all of those things. So putting a business plan together is extremely important, and quite frankly, there isn't a loan officer in town 
or anywhere that will talk to you unless you have a, bu uh, a business plan. So what are the tough issues of starting a business? The cash to inject into the business, the collateral to back the loan, and then thirdly, credit. And the LDC looks at these differently than the conventional institutions simply because we know these are the three big weaknesses. The other uh, component that, that figures very heavily in that is that there isn't a lot of startup funding around. And most banks have a rule of thumb. Unless you've been in business for two years and have been successful, they're going to have a hard time justifying lending you money. I get calls every day from folks um, saying that hey, I have a dream of going into business and I want you to help me to get a grant uh -huh. to go into business. That's, that's the most common thing that I hear. And um, the government just is not in the business of giving away money to entrepreneurs to start a business. For cash injection, we require 10 to 20% risk on the entrepreneur's part. Save up 10 or 20% of your deal and we'll look at doing 80 to 90% of your deal. Uh, collateral, the assets to back the loan, there are several forms of it. The best form is cash or near cash, CDs, stock certificates, things like that. And then land, whether it's developed or not. So what we're trying to do here at the Center for Women is, is attack that particular problem from another angle. And that is to develop the skills of these business owners in the technical areas. Things like how do you optimize your cash flow? How do you build a marketing plan? How do you develop a customer service uh, strategy? So what we're doing is building the skills of women in the community so that when they're ready to start that business, they're ahead of the game. 93% of uh, all businesses in the United States are run by small businesses, uh, under 100 people in, in the business. And I want to tell you that as of right now, as of early 2007, the Center for Women estimates that there are over 17,000 women-owned businesses in Charleston, Berkeley, and Dorchester. And again, if you look at the fact that small business is the largest employer in the state, that's where we should be putting our economic development incentives. Why do most businesses fail? Not having a valid business plan because it helps to keep you focused on what you have researched and determined um, that your niche is in the marketplace and, um, and it helps you to stay on track. Uh, most businesses fail because of finances and that's not that it's undercapitalized necessarily it might it but it's that you don't have a understanding or have a resource around you who can really look at the finances of the business and tell you if you're making money or not how important is time management time is money so if you're not maximizing your time as an entrepreneur or as a business owner a business person then chances are you're probably losing money. You know, you can leave a, a job and, at five o'clock and forget about it and go home and play with the kids. Business, you just can't do that. It's a, you, you know, you can go and play with the kids, but half the time you're thinking about, okay, what do I gotta do tomorrow? When women start their own businesses, they're doing it for a lot of reasons. And I have to tell you that the primary motivation is not money. It's about having control over their lives. It's about having a flexible schedule. It's about being able to live a dream. It's about being able to no longer function in the traditional workplace. And instead, they're creating a workplace that will be uh, very amenable to what their individual needs are. And some women also said, particularly those who have children, so they wanted to leave a financial legacy. They wanted to be able to provide in a manner that a corporate position or a position with another organization may not necessarily provide in terms of wealth and health for their respective families and their nuclear families. And also, a lot of the women, particularly the African American women that I've studied, want to be able to serve as a role model within their communities. They want to be able to show others that yes, you could own a business, you can develop a business, and you can aspire to go beyond your circumstances. Actually, one of the biggest barriers to uh, people starting their own business is a stereotype about what it takes to become an entrepreneur. Should I start my own company? No, I can't be another Bill Gates. I guess I'll keep working for a corporation. That's a mistake. Uh, you're falling prey to the stereotype that you have to be like that, that, and you don't. Many people outside of the field get a steady diet of of these myths, one of the key ones is risk. Entrepreneurs mitigate risk. 
they look for ways to reduce it. And the way they reduce it is by either having superior knowledge, having superior networks, so that they understand things and they see things differently. So we're the outsider who's saying, oh my, look at all the risk they assume. It's because they don't know what the entrepreneur knows. Perseverance is tremendously important. Being able to live with integrity, to be able to deliver a product or service that um, has some meaning to not just the, the entrepreneur or the company, but to others. An ability to see opportunities where other people see problems is important. To be able to fulfill a passion and be able to develop an opportunity that allows that passion to grow and come through. It's not a destination, it's a journey. And it's very personal. To be able to see how others respond to that, to that passion and to be able to see how a person can be a change maker as a result. There you have it. Some of the most energetic and inspired people we've met in our travels around South Carolina. These have been people who believe they can meet challenges, solve problems, and maybe even make a living as they do it. What about you? Are you ready to take on a new challenge? Do you have an idea for a new business, an improvement at the company where you work, or an opportunity to teach your kids something new about earning, learning, or creating a better world? Go to our website, theconnectionshow.org, make a donation of money, send our website to a friend, or just let us know what you think. I'm Pat Job. Thank you for making The Connection.